Hi folks, it's good to be back here with you out of Blue Creek. I want to continue in our studies in the book of Revelation in chapter 16. Chapter 16 of the book of Revelation reads, And then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the, seven, of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. And the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing died that was in the sea. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers of the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters saying, Just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. Let's begin in prayer. God, I pray that as we look at this passage in chapter 16, that you would speak to our hearts. God, that we live in a corrupt world that is worthy of judgment, and that we know it inherently within our hearts. And yet, God, we, we are people that are broken because of the sin. And so, Lord, we ask that what the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 8, we shall know the truth, and the truth will set us free. It'll set us free from the captivity, the captivity of our body desires, but also the captivity of our minds. And I ask, God, that you would teach us your ways and be our instructors. You said in your word, call no man the teacher, but the Christ. And I pray, God, that you would minister into our hearts and give quickness to my tongue and quickness to their ears. You would encourage these people and strengthen them in a, in a day full of trouble and fear. We pray for this grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been looking at the book of Revelation. As we see in chapter 16, it's a fulfillment of what we saw in chapter 15, where it tells us that these seven angels, almost dressed in priestly garb, in the actual temple that is in heaven, coming forth with seven bowls of the wrath of God. And these bowls weren't vials, as some translations have said, that give the indication that they were deep pouring vestures, but rather they were small bowls, uh, like a bowl of incense that was shallow in its depths. And these were the agents of the wrath of God that were going to come upon the earth. And in chapter 16, it reveals to us the, the outpouring, if you will, of each and every one of these bowls. That as one bowl is poured out, there's a series of wrath coordinated with that. And as we saw in the book of Revelation, is it seems that these events are kind of layering upon one another. So that they're not strictly chronological, they're generally chronological, but they're laying one event upon the other. And the first bowl that is poured out, as it says there in verse 1, I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. And the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. And this was something that we brought out in our previous study. This is something they worshipped the image and they bore the mark of God. And those people at this time, so we saw previously, as opposed to the ones who received the name of God upon themselves, whether it's the church in Revelation 2 and 3, which receives the mark in the name of our God, that receives a white stone from God, where God is the imprint upon the person's life, or it's the 144,000 who are marked within their forehead. These are agents or servants of God that are, have his imprint placed upon them. And in the counterfeit of what God desires to write his name upon each man, Satan comes into the situation in Revelation chapter 13 and places his name upon man. So that the whole contest is who is going to rule the earth. And man seems to be the, the agent by which rulership is going to be obtained. God doesn't need man. God blessed man and loved man and gave man dominion of the earth. The devil stole the dominion of the earth. That's why in Matthew chapter 4, when Satan is tempting Jesus in his humanity, he said, bow down to me and I will give you the kingdoms of this earth. And Jesus didn't say, the kingdoms don't belong to you. They belong to man or they belong to God. But God gave the kingdoms to man so that out of his love, man could experience and express the nature of God upon the earth. 
And of course, there's a much bigger argument behind the purpose of the creation of man, being made a little lower than the angel and becoming a witness, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, against the spiritual wickednesses in the heavenly realms who have assumed a rulership of the earth. All that to say is that the devil needs man to rule the earth. He needs the authority in the same way in the Chronicles of Narnia, the White Witch needs Edmund and uh, all his brothers and sisters in order to rule through them vicariously. And as she rules the earth, she locks them up within the dungeon. And so these people under the judgment of the first bull, those people who had received his image. And as we talked about last time, the image of God is not just the, the issue of uh, our image of Satan is not just the issue of taking a physical mark or some like this, but it's actually once again, a replication of what God has intended for man. God intended man to be in the image and the likeness of God. Man sinned and lost that image and fall, fell short of the glory of God so that his life could no longer reflect it. But part of the redemption was a restoring back into the man the very thing that he lost when he sinned, namely the image. And so in Colossians, as we already said in chapter 1, verse 15, it says Christ is the image of the invisible God, the very thing we lost at the beginning. And Satan likewise tries to uh, inject into man his image so that he wants man on earth in the same way that man on earth was supposed to represent God. He wants man on earth to represent him. And this is the great struggle that was going on actually in John chapter 8. Jesus was combating with the Pharisees who were convinced and they said, well, Abraham's our father. And he said, if Abraham was your father, you'd be listening to the words that I'm telling you and agree that what I'm saying is from God. And this contest was going on back and forth between them about who is really the servants of God and who are not. The Pharisees fully believed that what they were doing was from God himself, as are all religious men. They wouldn't be doing what they're doing if they didn't believe that what they were doing was the path of righteousness. But here they were in the very face of the body of Christ, the very person of Jesus Christ, and they could do the most cruel and wicked things with a clear conscience because they believed that God had told them to do this, never testing their actions according to the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But believing themselves to be the arbiters of truth found themselves with a clear conscience, which we would call a seared conscience, attacking the Lord of glory himself. And what that tells us is that man can become so blinded by the devil that he can do the most wicked things he can call bittersweet and sweet bitter. He can call light darkness and darkness light with a clear conscience. But little does he know, as it was in the book of Isaiah in chapter 5, little does he know he's actually only making himself ripe for the judgment that is yet to come. God is allowing a man to be hardened in his heart and to express that hardening of his heart so that what you find in the last days, even as in John chapter 8, when they were with a hardened heart rejecting the Lord of glory in his first coming, and Jesus looked at them and says, your father is actually the devil. It was a way of saying, you have his image. You have his image. So that the people in the last days, it's going to be what Jesus said in John chapter 16, that a time is coming when men will kill you and think that they're offering a service to God. It's, it's what Jesus talked about in the seven letters to the seven churches, that they are of a synagogue of Satan. In other words, the last days would be known as a highly religious group of people that think themselves to be the truest and the purest and the bestest servants of God. And because of that, they are actually aligning themselves not with the brokenness that comes from, from understanding and hearing the gospel. Because anyone that hears the gospel understands there's, woe is me, I'm undone. But the man that believes himself to be attained or, or to has reached a certain level is the man that likewise gives himself permission to attack the other servants of God with an abandon, with a self-righteousness that he calls righteousness. He'll even say things like, we're standing on the word of God, but they're not standing on the word of God. They're not standing on the sea of glass. They're standing on the lake of judgment, the lake of fire, which is something that they will not be able to pass. So you find that the first judgment that God does in these final seven plagues that are coming upon the earth is dealing very directly with the group of people that have received the image of the devil, essentially in a roundabout way, and the number of his name. 
And again, we strictly make that a literal interpretation, which indeed it is literal. But it's something else going on within the passage. Even as we pray in the name of our Father, they likewise are praying in the name of their Father. They may have a prayer life, in other words. They actually are people that are given over to a prayer life. I knew a woman who was getting into heavy opioids, but she was hiding it. And at the same time, she was having deep revelations about the sins of other people. And it was as clear as a bell, a voice was speaking into her head. And she said the things that she said with authority and conviction and in honesty in a certain degree. But she didn't see the direction that her voice was pointing. And what little did the people know that were listening to her knew that, unfortunately I knew, is that she was addicted to drugs and she was essentially communing pharmakia with evil spirits that she was convinced were the spirit of God. And there's a level of truth when the devil speaks, but it's always a truth negating certain facts that justify an anger. It's not love that covers a multitude of sins. It's a hatred that seeks to expose a multitude of sins or supposed or perceived sins. And it's this attitude that is going to permeate in the last days that God, I would suggest to you in the first judgment, is going to be, be eradicating from the earth uh, because this is the poison that prevents men from actually coming into repentance. And I find it interesting. As you follow through these, these seven plagues that come upon the earth, it says three times, I believe in the text, and still men would not repent of their sins, which betrays the fact proves the fact that what God was intending was repentance. And many times people just repent because they're embarrassed about what they did, but it's not really repentance. It's a worldly repentance. They repent because they went to jail or they had some kind of consequence in their life, but it's not repentance. The Bible tells us, Paul tells us, that a godly repentance is what is necessary, not a worldly sorrow. And a godly repentance is when you recognize, I have sinned against Almighty God. And many people that find themselves in that vitriolic, accusatory role, playing essentially the role of the devil, have never repented. Rather, what they do is that they have uh, redefined themselves. They haven't had a heart of stone turned to heart of flesh. They've reshaped the stone. They've carved it into a different shape, but they themselves fundamentally have not been turned away. Their religion is a reforming of themselves, a bettering of their sinful nature, as opposed to the true religion, which is a rejecting of self, not masochism, but a rejection of the ability to ever improve myself and awareness that if there's anything good within me, it is actually the person of Jesus Christ. The second bowl that is open there in verse three reads as such, it says, the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became like the cor blood of a corpse and every living thing died that was in the sea and so what we find is the food source if we take this strictly as a uh, historical literal interpretation that, that that is yet to happen we find that everything within the sea it turns to blood i can't but help think of the gulf uh, back in 2008 i believe it was when there was the spill of a, of a, a oil pipe within the gulf of, of mexico and it looked like the sea turned to blood and of course everything within the proximity of that had died but something is going to take place previously in the eighth chapter of Revelation, a third of the sea died. But now we see here with the opening of the second seal, the entirety of the seal became like the blood of the corpse and every living thing died that was in the sea. And there's been certain interpretations of the book of Revelation that have tried to say that this is actually something that has taken place in past histories. The problem, there's no coordination of this event if taken in the literal sense. And thus, what they find is themselves spiritualizing it and saying that it's, well, it's not really what it means. It means such and such, or it means just the Mediterranean Sea, or it means, and they put a spin upon it. But what Franz de Leach once said, literal, if possible. And certainly the, the interpretation of this passage is in strict literal. And the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. So between the second and the third bowls, what you find is a destruction by and large of the food supply upon the earth. And secondly, a destruction of the water supply, food and water. God is taking away their life. 
They decided to, to worship the altar of the devil, to take his image, to play his role, to take his part, to be part of his kingdom. Therefore, God, who is life and light and water, uh, Jesus, who said of himself, out of me, I, anyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks of me will never thirst again. He's the fount of living water. As it tells us in Isaiah chapter 12, with joy, draw water from the wells of salvation. As they sang that verse from Isaiah 12, on the day of tabernacles, pouring the feast of water libation is also what it's called, pouring water upon the altar there upon the rebuilt temple of Herod's in the day of Christ. And they cried out with joy, draw waters from the wells of salvation. At this point, Jesus stands up in John 7, 37 and says, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink for out of his belly will begin to flow torrents of living water. And these people who have rejected the fount of living water these people who have played the role of the devil and says, we want you to be our God. They may not say that with their words, although some do. Their actions are playing out the role. The, the way they behave is playing out the role. And so God in kind says, your will be done. And which measured increased judgments, he's revealing to them the consequences of their decisions. But as opposed to coming unto repentance and crying out to God, they curse God all the more. Look at the fourth plague. And I heard, excuse me, in verse 5, And I heard the angel in charge of the water saying, Just are you, O holy one, who was, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. Now, what is the statement of this water, this angel in charge of the waters? Now, we could speculate about what the angel in charge of the waters is. The fact is, I don't know. You do see that what appears to be angels that are in charge of different parts of the earth. Maybe it was a special assignment that he was on. Are there angels upon the earth? Yes. A third of them are fallen, and that's what we would call demons. But this angel seems to be on the side of God himself. And being on the side of God, he looks at what just took place. The destruction of the food and the water upon the earth. And he says, just and true. You see, even at the end of the judgments, as we've already talked about in previous studies in Revelation 19, when all the wrath comes, the people of the earth say, just and true are your judgments. Righteous and true. God, in other words, you did everything right. There, there, you did nothing wrong. The, your judgments were not spurious. They weren't wrong or, or haphazard or or in the moment, they were fierce at this point in time, but they were as a consequence of a long, steadied resolve of continued warnings and rejected warnings, continual sending of the servants of God. That's why one of the pronouncements you'll see here in a minute was that they had judged and attacked the servants of God. They had spilled their blood, so they were given, we'll see, blood to drink. And Jesus said, which of the prophets, the servants, have you not killed? Again, who was he talking to? He was talking to the Pharisees. The very people who purport themselves to be the servants of the true and the living God are actually playing the role of the devil, thinking themselves to be righteous and secure. And as opposed to becoming more humble, they become more proud. And as opposed to being more singular in their focus, they become more intensely focused upon the approval of man and proof of that is their continual attempts to have affirmation through the means of gossip, through the means of slander, and what have you, which is what the word devil and Satan comes from. It's a, it's a having to reinforce, and, and only as an aside, that's what you see is when people constantly have to gossip and slander, what they're doing is they're looking for affirmation of what they're doing. It's not just a, the bleeding out of bitterness, which is certainly partially true, but it's looking for if validation because they have an inner conscience that's telling them that they're wrong. So what they have to do is keep on slandering, keep on proving their point, keep on attacking because their conscience is witnessing against them. So in that process of continual persistence and attack, they're hardening their conscience and setting them up the, themselves up for the day of the wrath of our God. But the angel says here, just and true, you did everything right. There's nothing wrong in anything you did. And here's the problem. Whenever men say vengeance is mine, he does something wrong. But whenever a man says vengeance is God's, he does not allow himself 
to get involved. The, the Proverbs tells us, if I could sum it up, and I can't remember the verse offhand, but basically, if you rejoice in God's judgment on another man, he'll take his judgment away because he won't have you rejoicing. He's talking to righteous people. He'll take it away because that kind of judgment is so serious and dangerous to the man. He says, Lord, you have done good. And in verse six, as I just said, for they shed the blood of the saints and the prophets and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. You reap what you sow, so says Paul. If a man sows to the flesh, he shall of the flesh reap destruction. You reap what you sow. If you gossip and slander and backbite with your wife, you're going to reap what you sow. If you attack other people, you'll reap what you sow. And, and this is always a consequence. And the problem was, when Jesus was talking to these Pharisees in John chapter 8, he was saying, your father is the devil, and he was a murderer from the beginning. Well, if he was a murderer and they were his children, they likewise were murderers looking for his death. But how were they looking for his death? Long before they put him on a cross, which little did they know was in God's foreordained plan. But long before they put them on the cross, they started with language. They started attacking the person. You have to create a character of a person. And the way that, that the enemy works through his servants is you isolate a man from his good qualities you highlight his bad qualities, then you make a caricature of the man surrounding his bad qualities, then you attack the caricature, and then that language ultimately leads to action. And these Pharisees, they were just kind of led down a path. They were led down a, a, a path of, of, it's like they couldn't help themselves. And, and we look at the devil and we think, why couldn't he read the book of Revelation and say, I'm not going to go down this path. It's going to destroy me. Because like man, he gets so entrapped within sin, he has to do it. And we've certainly known many people that have been so addicted to wicked lifestyles that they become hardened like Pharaoh, where God gives them over to the hardening of their heart. Not they're hardened because they fell into sin. But it's a rebellion against God and his ways. It's a hardening of their heart. They're going to double down on what's wrong because they refuse to be wrong, which is a statement of their pride. And so these proud men, they're so proud, they can destroy the servants of God. They can attack them. And they can do it with confidence, with vitriol, with a sense of empowerment. And little do they know that the power that is driving them is not the sovereign of the universe. It's not the God who says, who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died? Yea, rather is risen again? No. What shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? Shall suffering, persecution, peril, famine, nakedness, or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Jesus looked at these disciples in John 8, and he says, you will die in your sin. You're going to die in your sin. And they rejected this because they would look at themselves and say, we don't do anything bad. We don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, don't, don't hang with girls that do. And yet they forget the point and they didn't listen to him carefully because later on, once again, in John chapter 16, verse nine, I believe, there he says, I've come to the world. The Holy Spirit's gonna come and convict men of sin and righteousness and judgment of sin because they have not believed on me. The sin of the Pharisees is they did not believe on God. He told them, he says, you, you, you listen to the words I'm saying. You talk about Moses and Abraham, but the reality is if you really believe them, you'd believe what I was saying. And the fact that they had this inherent hatred and this kind of doubling down upon their exposure of the sin of Jesus and trying to create slander and accusations about him they were heaping judgment unto themselves. You know, in the book of Job, when his accusers came and told him he was in sin and kept going after him, I mean, these were pretty gnarly statements they were making. They needed, Job needed to pray for them. And, and the kind of, or rather is it with Abraham. Abraham with Abimelech and the whole thing is that they, they needed to go back and pr have him pray for him in order to be healed. And that righteous man 
praying for the ones who had attacked is the kind of humility that is needed in order to bring true healing. But they had so identified Jesus as being such a riley character for them to now submit to his authority and say, would you pray for me? Which is what humility looks like. They couldn't do it. They literally could not do it. So they double down and they attack. And that's why, again, why Jesus said, which of the servants of God have you not killed? You guys have killed all of them from righteous Abel to, to all the way Zacharias. You guys have always killed the servants of God. And it wasn't the lost in this world who were addicted to sin. It wasn't the beginning of John chapter 8, the woman caught in adultery. The woman was caught in adultery, but he said, your sin, speaking to the Pharisees, speaking to those who were accusing her, you're going to die in your sin. What was their sin? They rejected the God who they claimed to be serving. And that's a scary thing. Next time or two times from now, two studies from now, we'll get into John chapter, uh, Revelation 17. And it talks about mystery, Babylon, the great, but the woman that rides the beast, the woman that rides the beast is drunk with the blood of of the saints. And there's certain people that their histories are marked by splitting and, and attacking and causing ruin wherever they go in the spiritual realm. Doesn't mean we can always avoid conflict. But there's this pattern of attack against the servants of God. They are drunk. And he says, they shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And then it closes in verse 7 by saying, and I heard the altar saying, yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. And the fourth angel, verse 8, the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. And they were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. In Matthew's gospel, it says that God reigns upon the just and the unjust. In other words, he sends forth his blessings upon righteous men and unrighteous men. The unrighteous man right now can look at the beautiful scene that I'm in. He can come out and breathe the clean air. He can enjoy the goodness of God. Look at everything man creates is a place of disaster and contention and strife. But where God creates, it's peace. It's life. And God rains these things down upon man, and yet man doesn't glorify God who created them. That's what Romans 1 is talking about. They did not glorify God, therefore God gave them over to what they wanted, which was the destruction of their own flesh, which was his judgment against them. And though he reigns upon the just and the unjust, and they don't glorify him for that, when he does enact judgment upon them actively, not passively like Romans 1, but actively, like Revelation chapter 16, when he does take his judgment and his thumos is revealed, as opposed to humbling themselves, they curse him all the more. Logic alone would say, repent. Logic. I remember a guy, a young guy years ago said, if, if God is real, why does he do this and that? And he names off all these evil things. I said, so you're basically saying that God is evil. And if God, the almighty of the universe, was evil, wouldn't you logically then kiss up to him? Try to get on his good side? But the fact is, he's not evil. And he's patient with man, Peter tells us, not willing that any should suffer. But he's long-suffering. But that doesn't mean he's never going to judge. And the day of judgment has come. And the day of judgment is we see upon our nation, and we pray that it won't come, but it could, and it may. And when that day of judgment comes, men will be held account, not to the opinions of men in a democracy where we vote for wickedness or enforce it in our current situation, unfortunately, but it's where God Almighty has his say. Not the kings of the earth, not the great men, they will perish they will pass the current administration of our country, which is full of wickedness, people. It really is. We'll stand account before God and give it a judgment. I will stand before God. And each man will be open, naked, and revealed before him with whom we have to do. Next time, we'll look at the remaining of the chapter. 
And he talks about Babylon the Great, and then it exposes Babylon in great detail in chapter 16 and 17. Let's pray. God, I pray that you put your hand upon us. We thank you for your grace. God, I say these things with a broken heart. There's not an ounce of anger within me. And we need your preservation. We need your healing. And God, we pray for your return. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. I love you all. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.